Here in the third week as we are diving into parables that we've been taking a look at and talking about how these parables relate to our everyday lives. So our first week, we talked about the four different soils and what those soils mean. And then last week, we actually dove in and talked about the mustard seed and the yeast. One of the uh, folks that were, were here actually had a mustard seed with them. So last week when I said, hey, does everybody have a mustard seed? Someone actually did. And just so you know, it's not the tiniest seed, but it is the tiniest seed that farmers are able to plant. But we talked about that mustard seed, and then with the yeast, it's the things that we put in our lives and the things that we allow in our lives. So if you're here today, obviously you want to have God's Word as a part of your everyday life, and you want to have that permeate every part of who you are, whether it's work, school, just meet people on the street, whatever it might be. So those are the first two weeks that we dove into. Today we are going to dive into the weeds. And that's all, this is always the most difficult of all the parables because it makes you really kind of take a look at yourself and also take a look at our lives. So before we do that, let's just go ahead and bow our heads and let's get our heads and our hearts right and we can dive in. Lord, this is your time. God, we thank you for it. Every one of us has friends and family that aren't feeling well right now and we we'll lift them up to you. God, would you just, uh, you're the mighty physician. Lord, would you just put your hand upon them, help them to feel better. But God, at the same time, for all of us that are here, for all of us that are sitting here with you today and before you today, God, would you help us to put the pause button on all of the distractions, on all of the busyness, and all the places that our minds tend to wander, and help us to just rest and focus upon your word. God, this is your time once again. Help us to redeem it as your word shares with us so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We will not have the verses up today, so there's a Bible in front of you in the pew. Once again, we'll be in Matthew. Matthew was a Jew that wrote for the Jews. In chapter 13, and we'll dive into verses here in just a little bit. Last night, I was blessed to, to be able to go out with three young teenage girls, all the age of 14, all three that played basketball for me. It was Becca and two of her, of her teenmates. And they're in, on cloud nine because we decided to go see a movie. And the way that movies set up nowadays, you just it's, it's not like the old days where you just go buy a ticket and then you hope that it's not sold out and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, you have to go online and actually reserve your seats if you, if you get in these nicer theaters. Not that, you know, I don't know, there's leather or recliner kind of things and it's kind of cool how they have this stuff set up. And if I'd live there, if I could live there, it's that great. There's the Mountain Dew downstairs and popcorn and then upstairs there's these great recliners. So we go out to reserve the seats. And it was the best possible thing for Becca and her friends because there was three seats available in one row and one seat available in another row. <laughs> Dad wouldn't be there to embarrass the three teenagers just in case, you know, there's any cute hot boys, that kind of thing. But Dad was also within eye range, so that just in case, you know, if he had to come in and go, hey, you know, give one of these, I could see. So I, I'm not going to endorse or say anything bad about the movie that we have seen, but it was me, number three. I'd seen Maze Runner 1, and I would just tell you that if you want to skip number 2, you're going to be lost. Because I was there lost, and I didn't know who anybody was, and it's about all these kids, and they've all grown up. But when I first got in there, where my seat was, because it's a reserved seat, I've got a ticket. You know, it's one of those where, hey, listen, I've got a ticket, I'm supposed to sit right there kind of thing. But someone was sitting in my seat, so I've got to make a decision. So me being the godly man that I am, I grabbed the lead, threw it right there, you know, there's a couple, I just let them sit there. So the whole rest of the row was open. I thought, well, I'll just move two seats down. And I sat down and I did what, you know, any dad would do. I checked back. The girls all seemed to be good. They were eating their candy and, you know, drinking their sodas. And life was good. But about five minutes into the movie, all of a sudden, people started showing up into our row. So I slowly started getting pushed down. Well, before I had gone to my seat, there was a couple that was sitting in my actual chair. And... When I came up to hold my ticket, they looked at me, and the first thing they did was they gave me a stink eye. You know, like, we're in the right seats kind of stuff. I'm like, hey, you know, all's good, it's all good, I'm not gonna make a scene and stuff, so I just moved the two seats down. But when I sat down, I noticed she kind of like gave me one of these, like, you, you didn't know where you're supposed to be sitting kind of thing. I'm like, all right, it's good, we're fine. Well, the people started showing up, they kept pushing me down and pushing me down and pushing me down, and finally, like, we need one more seat. So I looked at the girl, and the girl looked at me, and she is sure that she is in the right seat. And I already know that I've been in the wrong seat three times so far. So I'm like, well, I will take it. And I'm like, well, my, my ticket says F10. And she's like, what? And they pulled her ticket out, and she's like, we're in the wrong row. <laughs> so all of a sudden, mass people get up, and they're like heading out, and they're like leaving me, and I'm feeling like LeBron on the trade deadline. So I get up, and I, and I move over two seats, and then I sit down. Now, I don't mind sitting on my own. And the reason for that is because I see that as an opportunity to get to meet new people. And so 
the guy that ended up sitting next to me, he was like one well, of these contemporary new age guys. He had like a man bun, you know, and he was sitting down and the shirt was real tight, you know, and when he sat down, he did just sit down and he had to like, you know, rotate and everything and sit down and next to me. He was a cool guy. So we're sitting through the movie, I'm chatting with him a little bit, and some things would happen, and I, I lean over and I'm like, I, I don't know any of this. And he's like, Yeah, I missed the second one. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, I'm so thankful that you are here because neither of us know what's going on now. And then halfway through the movie, the best thing could have happened happened. The, the recliners all reclined out, and the girl that was sitting next to him, it was like a dead silent part, and she reclined back, and the leather made a noise. <laughs> So the movie's going on, and we're, we're kind of enjoying it, and all of a sudden, there was a part that wasn't scary at all, but muscular man bun guy next to me jumps a little bit, and I said, yeah, are you afraid? He goes, I'm not afraid. He goes, but my girl that's here with me, she jumps at everything, but she jumps at me and jump. I'm like, well, okay, well, I got you. So I, I got you. You're good to go. It, it, this is not a scary movie, by the way. Five minutes later, she does it again. He jumps again. I look at him, he looks at me, and I'm like, hey, sometimes you just can't escape it. You know, what do you just enjoy it and just enjoy the movie? And he keeps grabbing his chest, he's all this And this is supposed to be an, an, an action adventure. And he's starting to do a scary movie because of the person that's sitting next to him. So we get all the way through this movie. Just so you know, everyone dies at the end. You try to have a conversation. I love that. You watch the movie if you want. Um, but we got done. Talked to God. Hey, nice media. Head out with my girls. Got got up to the car and I started thinking, you know what? There's some things in our lives that are just unescapable. You can go in with all the right intent. Listen, I bought my ticket, and it says this ticket number, and you're sitting in my seat. And how dare you sit in my seat that I reserved online because I paid the $2 convenience fee for this seat. Because that's the, that's the side that I'm talking about. There's a convenience fee for you, you know, renting it or getting it online. Wouldn't it be great, moms, if we could, like, with our husbands, we brought, you brought the laundry bill, and you said, um, that's going to be a $2 convenience fee for each shirt. <laughs> and dinner, all your kids, whoa, 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 before we say grace, it's going to be uh, $3 for each of you for convenience fee for me, you know, preparing all that. Moms are like, yeah, we, we take that in our day. Well, they have this convenience fee for you to sit down. It'd be very easy for me to give her a hard time and say, you're the wrong, and how dare you, but then if you have it wrong yourself, then you're embarrassed about it, right? And to make a scene. What is that really going to do? It's, it's inescapable at times that people are just going to mess up. And that includes me. And that includes you. But when it happens, how we react to it is completely up to us. So I chose to go two seats down. I chose to let the lady give me a stink eye. I chose to give her karate hands once just to let her know that I meant business. I chose to allow me and one guy to come to me and to push me down. I chose to make a comment when the seats moved. And I hope that all of you would because as believers, that's funny. We can have some fun now and then. And at times, we make the choice as to whether to choose to do good or to choose not to do good. And it's really simple, but the choice is ours because these things are unavoidable. These things are something that we can't escape. They're going to happen. But how you and I respond to them can make all the difference in the world. And here's the thing about it. God expects us. God challenges us. God calls us to choose Him. And after we've made that choice, He calls and shows us that there's a harvest because of it. And so many times within our walk, we've made that choice for Him. But too many times in our everyday walk, we choose not to reflect him. And that leads us to the parable of the weeds and the tares. Now, or the wheat and the tares, excuse me. Matthew chapter 13, which is where we're going to dive in today. God understands he's going to share things from the culture at this time. There's going to be a discussion based around it. So, if it's inescapable that we're going to have these moments, it doesn't matter if we're at work. It doesn't matter if there's people that we've been working with for years and years or someone that's brand new. It doesn't matter if it's a visitor, if there's a new visitor sitting with you at church. You're in school and there's a new student. You are the new student. You're changing season from basketball to track or, or to nothing at all. 
these moments will come up, and we are going to face them. But also, they can happen in our everyday lives, whenever we make choices with our finances, whenever we choose to lease as a buy, whenever we get upset because we got overlooked for the promotion, whenever we deal with customers that, oh my goodness, some of these customers, if you'd have heard what they said and how they treated me, I deserved I was allowed, I was okay when I responded back this way. Some of these things seem insignificant, and yet they are so large for everyone that is around us. But it's also before God, the one that you chose as a believer. So here we dive into the parable of the weeds. And Jesus starts off and he tells them this parable. Once again, anytime he's found talking a parable, he's sharing his wisdom. He says, Jesus told them this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And so he is talking about, right from the beginning, the most important subject that is known to man. And that is the kingdom of heaven. Because the arguments that people bring about, that what it comes down to, many times isn't just about death. It's what happens after death. And people want to have proof, and they want to know for sure. And even at this time, there still was a discussion about heaven or hell or nothing at all. And so Jesus is sharing from his standpoint. He's saying, listen, the kingdom of heaven, this is so important. This isn't just the here and now. There's so much more to it. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good field, seed in his field, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. But while everyone was sleeping... His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. So, at some point, the farmer sowed the seeds. At some point, he scattered them about. At some point, he planted those. When we talk about planting those seeds, you have to continue to water those. You have to continue to fertilize those. And you have to continue to take care of those because you don't know when they're going to suddenly sprout. You don't know when you're going to first see something coming from the ground. And based on this, we don't know what it is exactly that's coming from the ground. We hope it's what it is that we planted. And yet here's this farmer who's taking care of his seed and out comes his crop. And somewhere along the way, someone stepped in and put weeds in amongst the good stuff. Spring is coming out. I think it's only like... Eight more weeks away, ten more weeks, three more months, five more months, however far away. And we are all going to make a decision at some point. And our decision in our family each and every year is when to mulch. Not whether to mulch, but when to mulch. And we miss it every other year. We get to the point where we're like, ah, it really even make sense to mulch. But we do that because you want to keep the weeds down, right? And the proper way to do it is to pull the weeds first and then put the mulch over. But when you pull the weeds, you have to pull them in a certain way so that the roots come all the way out. Well, in my mind, that's a lot of extra time. So if I can just throw the mulch on thick enough, the weeds aren't going to come through it, right? In my mind, if I just smother those things and suffocate them, I don't have to worry about any weeds. But see, that's not how weeds work. Weeds want to be seen. They want to be noticed. They'll fight through whatever it is just to sprout a little bit to say, hey, here I am. And now... You added four more inches of mulch on top of it, so now I'm even bigger and I'm stronger. And now what are you going to do with it? They're going to come up. So when the seeds were planted and when the weeds came in, if you'll notice the way this reads, it says, But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. See, when the devil attacks you, once he knows he has you, he leaves you alone. He'll do whatever he can to convince you so that you'll hold on to something and so you'll tie yourself to it. And then he's just going to leave you alone. You know why? He doesn't have the resources. When he left heaven, he took 30 angels with him. So that means two-thirds of the angels are here. So there's two-thirds angels for every one-third demon. So with one-third, one-third fighting, there's one-third of the angels that are looking out for you. We're a third ahead. And the devil knows that. So what he's going to do, rather than make money on the outside, he's going to try to mess with you on the inside because he wants you to believe that anxiety is okay. He wants you to believe that it's okay to worry constantly about your job or it's worry constantly about where you live or your finances. He wants you to believe that it's okay to die. He wants you to hold on to that anger that you have. 
He wants you to remind you about it every single time you come up. He wants to say it's okay to procrastinate and just to kind of stand still. Because once you believe that, his next play is this. I'm just going to leave you alone. Because you and I then have a choice to make. Am I going to recognize God in it or am I going to rest in those things that are not of God? And too many times we rest in those things that are not of God. And so see, it's growing up as we're growing up. And many times we don't recognize it until it's time for harvest. See, they didn't recognize the weeds until the wheat started becoming the wheat. And these the tares that they're talking about here, they look the exact same until it's time for harvest. And then it's at that moment when the wheat sprouts its head that all of a sudden they realize, oh my goodness, there's, wheat, um, there's weeds amongst the wheat. So it's over all this time, and finally it's time for that wonderful harvest, and they're mixed in amongst us. And that's what? That's work. That's school. That's the teams we play on. That's in our hobby. That's in the people that we love. That's in our family. It's everywhere that we go. And so Jesus is sharing with the crowd, and he's talking with everybody here within this parable. And so he continues, and these are the words that he says. He says, the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? So the first thing is, they point it back to him. Come on, wasn't this your job? I mean, are you sure that you were doing what you were supposed to be doing? I mean, were you asleep at the wheel? Are you paying attention to what's going on down here? You ever do that with God? Come on, God. This is what I need. This is what I want. Maybe it's not what I need, but it's really what I want. Are you paying attention? Are you, are you going to show up on time this time? Because I've been asking, and I keep asking. And I ask for a year, and I ask for five years, and I ask for ten years. And that thing that I want, that I want, that I want, it's not showing up. Are you sure that you and I are on good terms? Because I'm not thinking you care all that much about me. And so we pass the blame back to the farmer. We pass the blame back to our Savior. We pass the blame back to our Creator, who created us lovingly. And once, once what is best for us based on the kingdom of heaven. So the conversation continues, and he says, and then he did this, he replied. Uh, let me go back for a second. He says, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then, where then did the weeds come from? And then he did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? So all of a sudden it's like, okay, so it had nothing to do with you, had nothing to do with what's going on. Do you want us to go pull those weeds out? Out then. Let's go help. We're going to dive in. Let's go pull those weeds out. It says, no, he answered, because while you were pulling the weeds, while you were pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. So in other words, God is going to allow that. Because it's, it, we can't escape it. There are going to be weeds in our lives. We cannot escape it. It can't happen. So knowing that, knowing that it's going to be a part of our life, and then also knowing that God is not going to necessarily uproot us because he doesn't want to take away your foundation. He doesn't want to uproot you as a believer. He wants you to grow right where it is that he has planted you. And knowing that this is around us. And knowing that this is a part of our life. And knowing that it can show up in any way. And many times we won't even recognize it until, oh my goodness, it's time for the harvest. But it can't be escaped. So Jesus shares these words. He says, here's how we're going to handle it. He says, no, he answered, because while you were pulling the weeds, you may run up the whole wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let both grow together until the harvest. You're going to deal with people that are loud. You're going to deal with people that are angry. You're going to deal with people that are going to curse you. You're going to deal with people that are going to make fun of you. You're going to deal with people that are going to stab you in the back. You're going to deal with people that don't really care about you. Even though, God bless you, every, even though every week we talk about, man, the people you need in your life, people that love the Lord, people that love you no matter what, people that have your best interest in mind. You may feel that, and it may seem that way until the time of harvest, and all of a sudden you're like, what just happened? I got completely blindsided. God understands that. That's the world in which we live. He says, at that time, at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then, gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. The symbolism here is this. We're going to take all of them up together. And when it's time, we're going to first take all the weeds and we're going to separate them. 
We're going to wrap them up, and we're going to toss them in the fire. And so for all those that chose to live their way, and all those that chose to do their own thing, and all those that chose to not recognize God, and to not believe that God was in their life, eventually, at harvest time, they're thrown into that lake of fire. But for all of those that did believe, for all those that had that harvest, for all those that sprouted, we're taking all those and we're going to put them into my barn. Now see, the people are listening to this, and they're all like, oh, that's a really good story. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, the meat, and oh, yeah, the farmer, oh, I've been farming out my whole life. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, I didn't know, really know what to do with the weeds, and I, I wasn't sure. I, I pulled them out. Man, when I pulled them out, I, I went to plant some of the weeds back, and the, the roots really weren't there. There wasn't enough ground on it. There wasn't enough nourishment. And I didn't get the harvest that I thought I was going to get from it. And, I just waited. I could have separated them later. And, man, I wish this guy would have told the story earlier. And they take it to all of the wrong things. They take it to all of the wrong areas because they don't know. But as believers, if the kingdom of heaven matters, we know. And if the kingdom of heaven matters, then we have to take this time and say, how is it? But I can take this when I walk into my mission field. And thankfully, Jesus gives us the answers. If you'll move forward to verse 36. Now, the parable in the middle was about the mustard seed and the yeast. And we went over that last week. If you didn't get a chance to see it, you can go online and look at those and, and listen to that parable. This is the time now where Jesus sits down. He talked to the whole crowd. But now his disciples are having this, this teaching moment. And so when he has this teaching moment, this is the time when Jesus would sit before them. So we as disciples are all here together. And this is that time for us to learn. And so here's what Jesus says. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And Jesus answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and who will do evil. They will throw them into the fire furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then, then, which is the next thing that happens. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has the, he who has ears, let him hear. See, too many times we stop at the end of verse 42. When we hear about the weeping of the national teeth, and all, oh my goodness, we stop at one moment. But before we get into that, here's three things you need to understand. You need to understand from this lesson and from this message to his disciples. Because as believers, we are his disciples. And the first thing is, we just can't escape the weeds. You just can't escape them. They're going to pop up. They're going to happen. They're going to be there. I, I shared this story with some of you uh, here a while back. When we first moved into our house in Firestone Park, we didn't have a lot of money. And, and you know, so, but we wanted the house to look nice and the stuff outside looked nice. And we and I really liked planning and making nice plans, all kind of stuff. And so the, the previous owners were very meticulous about everything. And they knew this is going to run here and this one here and this will grow back up and this thing got replaced and all kind of stuff. And so we had all these plants and, and everything was looking really, really good. And so we went in the back and because they had stopped over at the house and she was looking at this and this looks really good. And we started in the front and went to the side. That looks good. We went to the back and Deanna was going, you know, I planted this here and I planted this here. They had the little plastic things next to it so you know what gets on and what doesn't. And then there was this one beautiful plant with flowers on it. And it was taller than everything else. It was fantastic. And we looked at it and said, I don't really know what that is, but it's just really pretty and it's amongst it, so I don't know what it is. And the lady looked at the and me and she looked back at it and she would walk in into the middle of the flower bed, reach down and pull it up and shook all the thing off and toss it aside and said, That's a weed. <laughs> the, most, the most beautiful crowning moment of our entire flower bed was a four foot weed with flowers on it. And we did nothing. It, it just, that's what happened. And it grew in this glorious lake, and it was hidden amongst all of the beauty. We cannot escape the weeds. You can't. They're inescapable. 
They're amongst you, but you also are amongst them. Second thing is from this. Your main responsibility, my main responsibility, is to focus on your responsibility. Is to focus upon you. And too many times we let so many other things get in the way that we don't focus upon our area in ministry, our area in life, but especially our area before God as a believer. Your job isn't to spot and burn the weeds. Your job isn't to pull the weeds. Your job isn't to go out and go, there's a weed, there's a weed, there's a weed, don't get that weed, don't get that weed. And so many times what ends up happening is we get so focused on all the other weeds that we don't get focused on our everyday walk. <laughs> Dallas Duncan, for many of you that, that, that don't know, he was my, my, him and Tim Smith were my first two mentors. And they put their arms around me, and they taught me the Bible, and I screwed it up left and right, and I said all the wrong things. And they kept their arms around me, and they kept their arms around me, and they said, keep working with this, keep learning this. And through that time, I learned more and more from God's Word to the point where I was able to teach it and preach it. But I couldn't believe how many people criticized Dallas. It didn't matter how big the church was. It didn't matter how many church plants we had. It didn't matter how many times his dad went on a mission trip to go help people and to care for people. None of that mattered. There are still people that are going to be critical of Dallas. <coughs> and criticize them. And I'll tell you what, it wore them out. And I hate to say it. It bothered me a lot. And the more I try to encourage him, the more he would hear these other voices because that's what he heard most of the time. And so that one voice, my voice, that one voice, his wife's voice, that one voice, his kid's voice, that one voice, whatever that voice might be, in the end, Morgan didn't help him. It actually wore him out to the point where every other voice was all he could hear. And it was tiring for him. But pick a pastor that you like. Rick Warren, wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guy. Wrote the Purpose Driven Life, second most read book in the entire world to the Bible. And yet there's still people that criticize him. Joel Osteen, let's rip on the guy. All he talks about is prosperity. Let's tear him up a little bit. Andy Stanley, oh, you know what? What about Charles Stanley? He's divorced and he's still preaching. And Andy and him had this big falling out, and, and did, we don't know all the ins and outs of that. But people will look for a reason to criticize. And to put all those people down. And when that happens, and this happens to you, it happens to me, what ends up happening is we stop our everyday life of preaching before others. And I don't necessarily mean preaching God's word. It sometimes means being that example. Dallas' grandfather, uh, the founder of ABC, would say like this, I want to point that one finger at you, but I want to forget about those three fingers pointing <coughs> And so because of that, I'm so willing to point out your sin and where it is that you miss the mark of God that I forget that I also have that sin and I'm going to take it to God. And we have to be careful with that. The first Bible that I ever read, because growing up Catholic, we didn't read our Bibles. Deanne had a Bible and I opened it up and there was a note in there from her mom. And I, I will never forget this because every time... I go to read, I still think about this. And every time I give a Bible to someone or share a Bible to someone, I think about it. And what it said was in this, it said, Sin will keep you from this book. Or this book will keep you from sin. God's love letter is to each one of us. But there is an expectation. And that expectation is that we as believers will continue to grow. We as believers have that foundation. And also, that we as believers will sprout and show that we are believers even amongst the weeds. And the last part is this. Our true nature eventually becomes evident. Whose we are eventually becomes evident. We are so consumed with ourselves, eventually it comes out. When it gets to that time of harvest, people are going to know. If it's all about A number one and, and who I am, it will be revealed. But Jesus leaves with these last words in verse 43. He says, then, and this is after all that stuff like, takes place, the righteous will shine like the sun 
in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. We did the survey last time, like about a couple weeks ago. If you have ears right now, I want you to raise your hand. Okay? It's okay. A little bit of class participation here. Okay, if you don't have ears, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, good. So we all have ears here. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. In the end, God separates the weeds from the wheat. But in the middle, which we're all in, we choose, you choose and I choose, whether I want to be a weed or the wheat. But it's not your job, and it's not my job to pull those weeds. My job is to reach and care for others so that in the end, during all the struggles, through the pain, through the times I question God, through the doubt, through the why not, what if, what's going on, can you even hear me? That in the end, that you will sprout. And in the end, that you will flower. And in the end, that there is a harvest for each one. And that's the promise that Jesus gives each one of us. You and I will grow. We choose how it is we will grow. Before others and before God. And for those who choose Him in the end, there's a harvest. It's an eternal. Praise Team's going to come up. Remember, you sit with you, bow your heads, and just close your eyes for a moment. I want you to just chat with God here for a little bit. Just have a conversation with Him, just between the two of you. See, without God, we're all weeds. Think about that for a second. Without God, each one of us are weeds. But through God, through God, and through our everyday walk, we can be we. In this parable, Jesus is the gardener, not us. And too many times we try to trade places with it. In this parable, we're not the ones that's noticing the weeds. In this parable, we are the one that has to have that deep foundation to be planted before God. So where is it today that you need to stop weeding? Where is it today that you need to stop pointing fingers? Where is it today that you need to stop casting blame? And instead, where is it today that you can stop long enough to recognize God in those moments? Because there's a harvest awaiting for you. Where is it today that you need to put something away? Something inside you that just builds up Something inside you that makes you stop and push God aside and focus upon yourself. Something you can't control, something that's in the future, something that's way down the road that's not even on your radar right now, whatever it might be. Where is it that you need to come back to this moment before the loving Savior? God, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the parable that Jesus shared. We thank you for him explaining it to us. God, help us to understand that in our lives, that we aren't going to escape them. Instead, Lord, help us to look at ourselves through your lens. Help us to see as you see. Help us to be responsible for our actions, things we say, and how we treat others. Because in the end, people will truly know us for who we are. You already know us for who we are. So help us. Help us, Lord, every day to choose to be that we. So you need to pray. Amen. This morning I had some visitors that came. And I love when we're at a point where we need some help. Uh, today we had not one but two sound guys that were sitting. And so the videos we were going to play, we could play the videos. And Andy gave me the brief, how this how you do on the computer. He only had one arm, but he did. Click it all the way through. Click on this, click on this. And then one of those visitors actually said, hey, I can jump in the back and I can do that for you. 
To which I said to him, I just want you to enjoy this time that you have here. And then I asked him this question. How's it going to be you? And we went to the answer. They said, everyone's been nice except for three people. <laughs> and they're your kids. No, he was the only kids. But see, we had to go jump to do this now. Tamar played the keyboard a little bit louder, and Don pumped up his bass a little more. We didn't have a person to take today, but the person that normally takes is gone, and his son jumped in. And the person that normally makes the cookies, which is probably the most vital person in the entire church, wasn't here either, and someone jumped in. That's what family does. We look for reasons to help. We seek that opportunity to care for others. And we don't just do it here on Sunday. We need to go out and do that for the world. We're going to get up and stay here in a moment, but I want you to think about where you can challenge yourself. But when you go, you came here to grow, but when you go, where is it that you can be that week in your mission? Shame, please. Thank you.